This is Milton Packer, who says that HGLT2 is the modern day ACE inhibitor. He said 12 to 45% of the patients have a heart failure and diabetes together. That means he says that both heart failure and diabetes have excess amount of neprilysine, sympathetic system stimulation, and also the, the excess amount of the, uh, in the, in the stimulation of sympathetic nervous system. So both of them have a common pathway, and both of them are the two sides of the same coin. 16% of the patients of populations have diabetes, and 32% of the patients of coronary artery disease have type 2 diabetes, suggesting that heart failure, type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease are inseparable from each other. So we need to treat patients keeping these things in mind. So this is Braunwald's paper, who says HGLT inhibitors is the statins of 21st century. And he says that certain molecules, like for example, aspirin, penicillin, and statins, were remarkable drugs who were crowned with Nobel Prize. And needless to say, that aspirin and statins are these small molecules, which are basically enzyme inhibitors, which have made a lot of difference in the extension of lifestyle, life, life of a given patient. And I feel the HGLT2 are no different from these drugs. So coming to the history of this molecule, we are back in 1835, it was Peterson who first isolated florizine from the bark of the apple tree. And 50 years later, it was found out that it brings about glucose in the urine, and therefore it was used to evaluate the kidney function. In 1980, it was found that this drug has the inhibition of the HGLT transporter, and therefore it can be used for patients of diabetes. And florizine being poorly absorbed, had an action both HGLT1 and LT2 was again discarded as not a good treatment for patients. And eventually it was the analogs of florizine, which are nothing but the HGLT inhibitors. And the glyphosate that we have today are the four in number, the, the uh, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and of course the etogliflozin are the drugs which are available here. And in India, we have a remogliflozin as additional drug. Let's understand the kidney. And here in the, in the screen, you see the kidney picture. And what you see here, that the medulla of the kidney consumes a lot of glucose. And it is the cortex which synthesizes the glucose. And what does it use? It uses the glutamine. And the glutamine is a source coming from the muscle and removes the ammonia. And that's how it gets rid of H ion from the kidney. That's how the basic role of kidney to regulate the H ion. And the gluconeogenesis is done by the kidney. 20 to 30 percent of the glucose is produced by the kidney. And that's very important, especially in, in, the, in the phase of hypoglycemia. And therefore, when you have a renal failure, this hypoglycemic response goes off, and therefore these patients land up with hypoglycemia. What you see here in the arteriole, the blood sugar is 90. If we look at the venous side, the blood sugar is 90. This is because the kidney synthesizes glucose in, in, the, in the, it synthesizes glucose in the kidney. And these are the proximal coronary tubule. You see the S1, S2, S3, out of which the S1 has the HGLT2 which is about 80 to 90% absorption of the glucose and insulin. And this happens because there's the active transport of sodium outside the cell, which is the ATP dependent process, and the potassium gets into the cell. And because there's a void of sodium inside the cell, as a facilitated diffusion, the sodium and the glucose gets into the cell. So therefore, this is not the active transport but this is facilitated transport because of the action of the sodium potassium ATPase. And we have a very important concept of what is called a tubuloglobular feedback mechanism. And this mechanism actually controls the renal hemodynamics. And we know that the macula densa is very sensitive to sodium. And when the less sodium comes in patients who have diabetes because of upregulation of SGLT2, and therefore, there is the wrong information given to the afferent arteriole saying that the less amount of sodium is coming in, so the afferent arteriole is opened up, transmitting all the pressure into the glomerulus, bringing about the barotrauma in the glomerulus. And therefore, when you give HGLT2, obviously, you inhibit the transporter, 
and therefore the sodium levels come there, and that's how it inhibits the adenosine and the afferent artery, in, increases the adenosine, which constrict the afferent arterioles, and therefore it controls the hemodynamic of the kidney. So this is in short what I said about the physiology or the pathophysiology of diabetes and how the drug works. The HGLT inhibition, which takes place in the kidney, which brings about excretion of the glucose, supplement about 40 to 60 grams per day, which improves the blood pressure, improves the cardiac function, improves the function of the pancreas because of the offloading of the beta cells, improves the transport of glucose into the muscle, improves insulin resistance there, and also increases hepatic glucose production because of the production of glucagon from the from pancreas. And this is how what we have understood about HGLT2. Now, I, this is my first introduction. Secondly, I'm supposed to have a nephrologist with me. Unfortunately, he cannot show up because he has a serious patient to attend to. So I will step into his shoes of nephrology and present some of the data which he has to say. And then I have a very good friend, cardiologist, uh, uh, Dr. Jagdish, and he will take us to the cardiac part of the HGL to inhibitors. So before we begin, I thought the best way to learn medicine is what William Osler, the student of life, says, that first to acquaint yourself with the current knowledge of subject and the steps by which it has been reached. Secondly, and more important, read to understand and analyze your cases. So we'll analyze the cases so we'll understand how easily we can manage these patients. So this is the Valentine Lobo's job, who's a nephrologist, but because he cannot come, so I will run through these few slides, and then I'll hand over the mic to Dr. Jagdish. Is it okay, sir? Yeah, so thank you very much. So this is the first patient, who's 54 years old. He has, she has a diabetes of seven years duration. She's on glimepiride, metformin, tell me certain rotovastatin as a therapy. She is weighing 82 kilograms, her blood pressure is normal. Sugars are 135 fasting, Prandial is 202 with the A1C of 8%, and the GFR is 92 with the albumin creation, creatinine ratio of 22 milligram per gram. So with this finding, what is the target of A1C this patient will require, and what are the drugs which will bring down the closer to target? So to answer this question, the A1C goal to this patient will be less than 7%, obviously, because she's that way young. She's non-pregnant, and patient preference should be always taken into consideration to avoid hypoglycemia and the other adverse effect of treatment. And therefore, will the HGLT2 be useful in this situation, or will the additional benefit of HGLT2 be provide in this patient? So therefore, this is a study done in Germany, looking at 100 patients and odd in the first group having glimepiride with metformin, and the second group with the glimepiride, metformin, and dapagliflozin, you'll see obviously here the glycemic control is far superior when you add dapagliflozin to glimepiride, metformin combination, suggesting the efficacy of drug is quite good when you have the addition of this molecule with the sulfonylurea and metformin combination. So therefore, this patient is taking metformin and glimepiride, so addition of dapagliflozin or any HGLT2 inhibitor should improve the patient's outcome in this patient. The benefit, again, we have is the weight loss, which is quite well seen here with a drug called canagliflozin. And at the end of 52 weeks, you can see the weight loss to the tune of somewhere about 4.7% or 5, kil 5 kilograms of weight loss that you can get with this molecule and which can stay for a period of 52 weeks. Of course, it's dose-dependent weight loss. With the higher dose, you get a better weight loss. And what's interesting is shown on the right side of the graph is you can see this weight loss is predominantly a fat weight loss. And this weight loss is facilitated by the action of FGF1, which is produced by the liver because of transcription activity, and therefore this FGF1 reduces the fat content of these patients and therefore gets the benefit of the weight loss in here. So before you start the HGLT2 for any patient, any additional history is necessary? Is any testing warranted? Or what should you educate the patient about? So history of previous UTI is important. The history of pancreatitis, if you are giving a drug like DPP-4 inhibitor, which is commonly combined with HGLT2, has to be given. History of alcohol consumption is again important from the pancreatitis point of view. History of fractures, because there's some study which looked at the incidence of fracture with canagliflozin, and history of peripheral artery disease is also to be importantly considered. 
So the possible side effects are the ketoacidosis, which is normally when you reduce the dose of insulin or the patient restricts his carbohydrate too much, then you can get a ketoacidosis. The UTIs and genital mycotic infections are pretty common, but the genital hygiene is very important. That will see through the problem of the patient. And urine test will, of course, we will test for positive for glucose because you know that this is the basic action of this drug is to bring about glucosuria. There's a study which looked at uh, the mycotic infection. These are the five top class studies which looked at the incidence of mycotic infection when you use the combination of HGLT2 with the DP4 inhibitor, and it says it reduces smart significantly, and it's believed to be because of good glycemic control, number one, and number two, it is said that the DP4 receptor is also located in the fungi and the bacteria, and when you give them DP4 inhibitors, they get the beneficial effect of reducing the infection in the genital urine and tract. So this patient came up follow-up two weeks later, and uh, she complains of genital itching with a mild discharge. Now the question is, should you stop a drug? Is the role of treating through the infection? And what if the recurrent infection comes in? I think the answer is very simple. It requires a good counseling. You tell the patient about gen genital hygiene. Drink plenty of fluids, especially when you take the medications. And local application of antifungal drugs can be used, or even oral fluconazole can be used for a short period of time to overcome this infection. And more often than not, this infection lasts in the first few weeks of therapy. As you go beyond two to three weeks of therapy with this drug, the infection definitely reduces because of the good glycemic control. Your immunity springs back in action, and therefore most of these patients do not have that mycotic infection subsequently. So this patient followed up for next three months, came, the itching settled down. Her weight also dropped down by 2.5 kilograms. And the sugars also are shaping a normal direction. And she's worried that she has got a glycosuria. So she's saying, is this a cause of concern to me? You remove the glucose from your blood. Now I got the blood, I mean, I got a glucose in my urine. Is it a cause of concern? This is quite often patients come back and show you the report that the urine shows a lot of glucose. But I think you need to have reassurance. This is very important because this is the process by which the drug works. And this is how this patient has this benefit. Now, the GFR also has dropped to 86, its patient, and she has further lost 3.5, which is quite modest loss, which is not quite heavy. As I mentioned earlier, this weight loss is because of the FGF1, which is because of the programming of the PPAR alpha and PGC1 alpha, and the cholesterol receptor element binding protein, and these are the drugs which bring about this action of reduction of weight. And this patient now, continue to use HGLT2 without any problems. So looking at the renal effects, as I showed you earlier, there's a dilatation of the afferent arteriole. The kidney is a very peculiar organ where it has the afferent arteriole and efferent arteriole. Normally, after arteriole, you get a venous system. But here, this is the arteriole ending with the arteriole. This is to create ultrafiltration in the kidney. And that's why the designing by nature is that, that patient ha the kidney has both afferent and efferent arterioles. And all of you have 1.2 million nephrons in each kidneys. So both kidneys put together, you are 2.4 million nephrons. You are a millionaire so far as the kidney is concerned. So this is what happens to the afferent arteriole and the patients of diabetes. When you give HGLT2, the macular densa starts sensing the sodium coming there and gives signal to the afferent arteriole that brings about the constriction. You can see that the intraglomerular pressure is going down. And if you combine this drug with the ACE inhibitors, which can also open up the afferent arteriole, because there are receptors for the angiotensin 2 on the efferent arteriole. So if you give them ACE inhibitor, the efferent arteriole opens up, and therefore the patient gets the benefit of reducing the intraglomerular pressure. That's why this drug is you know, protective. And you can see at the column and the graph down that the initial drop in the GFR is a nephron protective. So that's a very important concept the patient needs to understand. And finally, DAPA CKD, which looked at more than 4,000 patients with the GFR of 25 to 75, with the excretion of albin between 200 to 5,000, and with randomized to receive DAPA gliflozin versus placebo. And the results you can see it very well. It has got uh, among the patients with CKD, regardless of the presence or absence of diabetes, the risk of composite of the sustained decline of GFR 
at least 50% end-stage kidney disease, and the death from CV cause or renal cause was significantly declined with the use of dapagliflozin. So we have a therapy now for patients of chronic kidney disease using the gliflozin. So therefore, the American Diabetic Association standards of medical care in 2021 included this drug in patients who have established renal disease, and therefore this was given a grant was, this was permitted to use in patients of chronic kidney disease. This was the immediate release, which was done on April 30, 2021, for the use of the patient's chronic kidney disease. Coming to the mechanism by which the drug works, of course, it is through the ketone bodies. Ketone bodies are the very oldest kind of, a, uh, kind of an energy substance, and it gives you production of the ATP. If you look at the amount of ATP produced with the oxygen using these kinds of superfuel. If it's, if it's glucose, you get three ATPs. If it's free fatty acids, which is a dirty fuel, gives you something about two ATPs. And if you use ketone bodies, it gives you three ATP molecules. So therefore, it becomes a superfuel. So that's how you get this improvement. And you can see at the bottom of the screen the beneficial effects, especially from the HDAC. HDAC is histone deacetylation, which is a very important process in the improvement of the cell survival. And plus, it also acts on inflammasomes, therefore brings about inflammation being reduced. And we also see that increased levels of hematocrit. That's also important action on these, those fibroblasts which are located in the proximal tubule, which are destroyed because of the oxidative stress, because of the hyperglycemia. The moment you get them HGLT2, these cells start producing erythropoietin, and the last important action is on the mTOR hyperactivation during diabetes patients, and these ketone bodies reduce the hyperactivation of the mTOR C1 pathway, and therefore improve the podocyte, and also prevents fibrosis in the kidneys. So these are the all molecular mechanisms by which we get the benefit of this particular molecule. Now I'll stop here, so far nephrol part is concerned, and I will change the gears and hand over to cardiologists. This again, the latest KDGO guidelines, which came in 2022. And this also says the same thing, that you have to have a good lifestyle. Then use SGLT2 and GLP receptor agonist in these patients. There's a flow study which is going to look at the semaglutide use in patients of kidney function. And of course, this is going to be a good drug for the patients of kidney impairment. So this is the second patient which will be discussed by uh, Dr. Jagdish Hiremat.